Welcome back, Lecture 10, Math 241. We are in the middle of uh, section chapter 6, 6.2 on volumes. Uh, probably about two thirds of the way through, we have uh, thus far uh, attacked problems that uh, were volumes of solids or evolution that uh, when we sliced them up, they were solid. When we had solid disks, we had no volume missing out of the inside. Depending on the axis of revolution, but um, we start with, in both cases, pi r squared h for the volume of one of the slices, solid disk slices. Um, the radius could be either the x value or the y value. So if it's the x value, then it's the uh, x value squared for the radius. And if you think about how that would happen, try to get these reviewed real quickly, and we'll go on to the third type, with, which is uh, the solid disk method obviously doesn't work. We try to slice it up and look at uh, these slices, which are washers. but we're having a hard time describing the inner radius and outer radius, so we moved to cylindrical shells, which would be the third uh, kind of attempt to get volume of that region. So if you think about the radius of this solid disk, if you think about that radius actually being x, then what would the thickness or height for that particular solid disk be? Yeah. That's some increment of y, is that correct? Yeah. So I know it, it looks awkward that we've got x squared dy, but we'd have to say what x is in terms of y, right? Make that substitution. And if that is the way the disk is shaped or formed, um, then we would go from some y value to some other y value. So that's if the disks are formed in this manner. If the solid disks are positioned this way, then this radius from the x-axis up to a point on the curve is a y value. So the radius is the y value. The thickness would be some increment of x, some delta x. So we would go from some x value to some other x value. Again, it doesn't look right, but we would make a substitution for x in terms of y to integrate the problem. We'd make a substitution for y in terms of x so that we could be able to integrate this problem. Solid disks are usually the, the easiest of the three methods. The other method is if we don't have a solid disk because of the nature of a, an inner radius and an outer radius, we've got a washer. Where capital R is the outer radius of that washer, little r is the inner radius. And um, I guess we can look at it in that fashion. Without breaking this down into, into pieces, just in general, If we have each of the slices being represented by a washer, and this distance would be capital R, and then to here would be lowercase r, then we want the amount of volume in that washer so it can be found in this way. It's up to us to decide what is, how do we describe capital R, what is the outer radius. Is it an x value on a curve? Is it a y value on a curve? Same thing with the lowercase r. What is it representing? If it's a distance from the x-axis over to a point, excuse me, from the y-axis over to a point, that's an x value, right? If it's a distance from the x-axis up to a point, that's a y value. So we have to pay attention to what curve we're on, and is it an x value or is it a y value? Um, 
I don't think we were in the middle of a problem when we ended class. I think we had just finished the problem uh, using uh, the washer method or the washer method. Now let's go to the third one, which is cylindrical shells. Uh, what might be appropriate is why would we need um, this third method? So here's a problem, and we'll actually do this problem. It is similar to one that's in the book, but it is a, a different graph, and the, the equation is slightly different. But if we have a curve that looks like this, I guess we could appropriately call this the nose curve. It kind of looks like a nose. And let me tell you, I'm an expert because the Griggses have some noses. Let me tell you. It's one way we can tell if they're related to the Griggses from Indiana. We check out the nose. Um, <laughs> So this is our good old friend, the nose curve. Here's the equation of it. Well, if we wrap this around the x-axis and we try to slice through it, I, I'm not going to kind of draw this and clutter the diagram up too much, but if we try to slice through this perpendicular to the axis of revolution and look at the inner and the outer radius, we've got an issue on this curve. Because the inner radius, just ignore this little thing here because that's the cylindrical shells part. But if we were slicing through this and trying to look at the inner and outer radius, the outer radius would be here. You would say, well, that's a y value on this curve. I'm already not liking that because what is a y value on this curve? What's that forcing us to do? Solve this equation for y? I'm not really interested in doing that. Okay, if it can even be done. And then you look at the inner radius. Well, what's the inner radius? It's also a y value on the same curve. So we're kind of stuck. The, the inner and outer radii are kind of the same thing in terms of describing them, so it's going to be difficult to write them in, in the form of an equation. So we're not going to use cylindrical shells unless we really have to, but we have to on this problem because uh, even though each slice looks like a washer, the washer method, is, we're not going to be able to do it. So what's it look like? What are, what are we going to um, kind of do with this thing called cylindrical shells? The name is pretty appropriate, because once we decide the little region of area, the skinny little rectangle that we're going to send around the axis of revolution, once we send that skinny little rectangle around the axis of revolution, we're going to form one of these, which is a cylindrical shell, a shell of a cylinder. Now, how do we accumulate these cylindrical shells so that we're going to fill up all the volume that we have? So let's say the region looks something like this, and we want to use cylindrical shells to come up with the volume. So we take one of these little skinny little rectangles, and we send that around the axis of revolution, which in this case is the y-axis. And as we do that, we form this cylindrical shell. Then we would go out a little further, send that around the axis of revolution to form another cylindrical shell, go out a little further, take that little skinny little rectangle, send it around the axis of revolution, and we form another cylindrical shell. So when you kind of put these things, I don't know if you ever played with a toy like this when you were a child, but they kind of fit right inside of the other, right? You remember those kind of concentric toys? You didn't call them that because the little kid doesn't know what that means. Mm -hmm. But you have a toy that one piece fits inside the other or outside the other, and you end up with something that looks like this. <laughs> so we can get the volume of something like this by using these things called cylindrical shells. You just kind of fit one outside the other until you have something that looks like this. If we hadn't chosen our rectangles to be quite so fat, we would match this curve quite a bit, this region quite a bit better than this seems to do. And that's the goal, is to take the skinny little regions that you're sending around the axis of revolution, make them as skinny as possible. So you can envision these being a whole lot thinner than this and matching this better than this appears to match it. So what we need to do is figure out how much volume is in one of these cylindrical shells and then start with that and then 
make it appropriate for each problem that we have. So let's take one of these um, cylindrical shells. So they're going to look fairly skinny, but we really want them to be a whole lot skinnier than that. So the reason that we shouldn't or we don't want to at least confuse this with the washer method is that we want this to be so thin that there's virtually no difference between the inner and outer radius. So it's not to be confused with slicing this thing up and forming a washer. We don't want this to be a washer. We actually want this to be a whole lot thinner than that. So let's say that we have this cylindrical shell. And we know by this time that whatever it is we describe in the integrand, we can describe one of them and they're all kind of able to be described by that one description. We can add together an infinite number of these things with the evaluation of the definite integral. So that's how we're going to go about accumulating volume. If I were to slice this thing, just kind of take a exacto knife and cut it right down there and roll it out, wouldn't we have something that looks like this? Use your imagination here, okay, on my diagrams. So we're going to cut it, roll it out. And this is what we really have. This is the amount of stuff, volume, in this cylindrical shell. So what is this distance? Keep in mind that it's really a whole lot thinner than what I've drawn. So don't worry about inner and outer radius. What is this distance all the way around here that once we cut it and roll it out, what is that distance? Good. That's the circumference of this circle. Right? So that's going to be 2 pi r. This distance, which is the height of the cylindrical shell, is this distance. So, so far, of the rectangular solid that we have by cutting it and rolling it out flat, it's 2 pi r by h, but it is 3d, so it does have some thickness, which actually I'll just call that th for thickness. So what is the volume of this particular cylindrical shell that we sliced and rolled out? It's length times width times height or thickness, 2 pi r times h times the thickness. That's how much stuff there is. That's the volume of this cylindrical shell. So if we can describe each cylindrical shell in such a way that we know what the radius of each one is, we know what the height of each one is, we know what the thickness of each one is, all we have to do is describe one of them and let the integral calculus add them all up, all infinite number of these things together. So eventually, if we can describe them correctly, we'll be able to get this cylindrical shell, which, by the way, has a smaller radius but a larger height, Right? Then the next one down, which has a larger radius but a smaller height. The next one down has an even larger radius and an even smaller height. But if we can describe them in such a way that the variables are represented properly from the curve that we're given, this curve, we can describe the radius and the height and we can describe the thickness, then we're in business. We can describe one of them. We'll just add them all up with the evaluation of the definite integral. So when we have a cylindrical shell problem, we'll start off with an integrand. And again, there are other versions of this that are in your book, and you can choose to memorize those. I just kind of like to start with the pi r squared h or pi times capital R squared minus little r squared, that kind of uh, gets me going enough where I can evaluate those things. We want a 2 pi r times h times the thickness. 
Now the thickness is going to be either delta X or delta Y, depending on how we generated the shells. And if it's delta X, then we'll use X values here. And if it's delta Y, dy, then we'll use Y values here. But that'll get us started. That's the volume of one of the cylindrical shells. So back to this example. Question on that before we leave that. Now, how many of you before this class had done volumes before? Okay, I can actually see it in your faces. I could have told you which ones had done that because I can see it. I mean, some of you are saying, oh, yeah, 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 I've already done that. Um, so you might want to hide your uh, expressions a little better from me. I've been at this way too long. Uh, now, how many of you that raised your hands, you also did cylindrical shells? You've all also done, okay. So I saw a few less hands in the air because if something is omitted from volume, this is usually the piece that's omitted, the cylindrical shells piece. So you can do a lot of problems with solid disks, a lot of other problems with uh, the washer method, uh, but sometimes this is not taught in that section. But it's needed some, so let's, let's see how it works. All right, so we have this curve, and I'm going to clutter this up, and I'll redraw this. Um, actually, let me do this. Let me clutter my own drawing up. So we have this curve that looks something like this. And we're going around the x-axis. So here's our axis of revolution. So we want its symmetric image down here, so it looks something like this. We slice it up. perpendicular to the axis of revolution, and we realize that we've got some missing volume out of the middle here. So we think, okay, the, the washer method is going to work. Here's where it falls apart. So we've got this equation. And we need to describe this distance from the axis of revolution up to here, because that would be the inner radius. Now, since we went from the x-axis up, what is that? When you go locate a point and you talk about its distance above the x-axis, you're talking about its y value, right? So that's the y value of this point. The y value on the curve, okay? Fine, I don't want to solve this for y, but maybe I could solve it for y and it might be doable. Then we say, I need to find the outer radius. So I go from the axis of revolution to this point, which is going to be capital R. But lo and behold, what's that distance from the x-axis up to that point on the curve? It's the y value on that curve. Well, that's the same curve. Part of it's up here, and then it comes around and comes back down here. It's not a function. Therefore, we don't have that kind of one-to-one -one thing going on. So when we talk about the y value, for this particular location in terms of x, we've got two different y values. That's an issue. The first issue is solving this for y. Not delightful, but possible. The second issue is the inner radius and the outer radius. They're just, they're the same. You describe them the same way. So that tells me that the washer method not going to work. Okay? It's not going to work for two very good reasons. So the only choice we have, since these things are kind of washer looking, is to go about forming the volume a little differently besides chopping it up in this fashion perpendicular to the axis of revolution. That works for the solid disk and it works for the washer, but it doesn't work in this case because our washer method has failed. So we have to abandon that method. So instead of, I mean, we're still going to form the, the three-dimensional solid the same way. We're still going to go around the x-axis. So it's still going to be a, a three-dymensional solid that has this symmetric image down here when we look at it. 
but instead of chopping it up perpendicular to the axis of revolution, we're going to take elements of area, little skinny little rectangles, this time parallel to the axis of revolution. So we want rectangles that are parallel to the axis of revolution. So very different in that regard from the solid disk method and the washer method. Tried washer, it failed, so this is possibly going to work for us. Now, what we do with this little skinny little rectangle parallel to the axis of revolution is we spin it around, revolve it around the x-axis, and as we do so, that forms a cylindrical shell. It forms something that looks like this. Does that help? visualize what we're doing. There's some good diagrams in the book. Um, yes, that entire page, 456, um, has a diagram. Actually, the diagram is very similar to this one, except it's oriented differently in the plane based on how those cylindrical shells were formed. But we have this one. Now I'm going to clutter up the diagram, and I apologize for that. But <clears throat> the first little rectangular region that we're going to work with is very tiny, right down here. And we send that around, and we form our first cylindrical shell right there. There's our kind of inside piece in this little children's toy. Okay, There's the first one. We continue to take these rectangles as we work our way out, and each time we work our way out, we form a cylindrical shell. So we get a bunch of these, concentric with one another, fitting right inside of each other, and we continue to work our way out, not skipping like I'm skipping now. I'm trying to make it less cluttered. But then we take this little region, spin it, or spin it around the x-axis, and we work our way out all the way to here. So here's our representative cylindrical shell. We know how much volume is in there, 2 pi r h times the thickness. What's the thickness going to be? What, how do we take this skinny little rectangle? It's actually labeled, right? The thickness is what? The y. Isn't that it? Yeah. Delta y. So this skinny little rectangle that we have, its thickness is delta y. which in the integrand for us is going to be dy. So that tells us we want to start at a certain y value. What's the y value where we're going to start here? Zero. Zero. Right on the other side of zero. So our first little skinny little rectangle that we send around the axis of revolution is way down here. Not much volume in that little cylindrical shell, but we start down here with these, and we work our way up incrementally with little delta y's until we get to the y value, what? Two, right? So our limits on this problem are from y equals zero to y equals two. That's where we take our skinny little rectangles. Our first one is right on the other side of zero. Our last one is right underneath here. Take those skinny little rectangles, send them around the x-axis. That's what generates the cylindrical shells. So on this problem, I'll bring the diagram back up as we need it. What have we determined thus far? Well, we determined the thickness was a delta y or dy. Since we're integrating with respect to y, we should expect to start at a certain y value. We decided that. So we're starting with the skinny little rectangular um, elements that we're going to spin around the axis of revolution. Right on the other side of y equals 0, we continue to use them till we get all the way up to y equals 2. 2 pi we can bring out front because there's nothing variable about that. So all we need is the radius and the height. All right, so I'm going to bring this diagram back. This distance from here to
to here. And again, don't worry about the, the fact that it, the inner radius and the outer radius might be different. We want them to be so thin that there's virtually no difference between the inner and outer radius. So this is the radius of this cylindrical shell. How would you describe what that radius is? We went from the x-axis up to a point, here it is, right here. There's the radius of this particular cylindrical shell. How would you say what that is? That's the y value, right? Because we went from the x-axis up. So we would say that the radius is y. So the radius is y. I'll go ahead and write it down. Am I going to have to change that? Or am I going to be able to leave that alone? Leave it alone. Why? You got dy. Because we've got dy. So the fact that the radius of this cylindrical shell is y, and we're integrating with respect to y, we're just going to leave it alone. Okay, now we need the height. Here's the height. This distance from the x-axis, excuse me, from the y-axis over to the point on the curve. Here it is right here. So that's the height. What do we typically call the distance from the y-axis over to a point on a curve? X. We call that x. Is that right? From the y-axis over to this point ought to be the x value of this point. So we come back here. What is the height? The height is x. Are we going to be able to leave that? No. We're going to have to change that and say, well, that's fine. It is x. But what is x equal to on this curve? Okay. And thankfully, we know that. We don't have to solve for that. So the radius is described on each cylindrical shell as the y value of that particular point on the curve. The height is described as the x value, the x value on this curve based on the equation that was given to us. That is the x value. And we would integrate with respect to y. Again, when you get to this point on the problem, you're a good two-thirds to three-fourths of the way home because this shouldn't be the difficult part at all. Any question about any part of this, Nicole? Is the R always going to be Y and the H always going to be X? No. Anybody want to answer that? Unless you evolve it the other way. Okay, unless we're oriented the other way. So if you want to see an example, uh, look at page 456 in your book and you'll see the cylindrical shells oriented differently. They would be like this. So if this, if our cylindrical shells looked like this, here's our radius. What would that be? From the y-axis over to this point is x. That was not the case on ours, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And the height of this would be from the x-axis up to this point, and from the x-axis up would be y. So it does depend on how they're oriented in the plane. Oh, I know the problem. I, we finished the problem, and I said we were going to go around a line that was parallel to one of the axes. That's what I, I was going to start class with that. guess I won't be able to do that since the start of class already passed by. Uh, but that's the type of problem we need to clean up before we leave this section. So you kind of answered your own question there. It kind of depends on how they're oriented in the plane. I'm not going to take this any further unless somebody has a question about how we get to a solution from here. Everybody feel confident with that? Distribute the y, integrate each piece individually. Uh, 2 pi is out part of the answer. We'll just save it to the end. Evaluate it from 0 to 2. And it should be the number of cubic units bounded between, um, not between, by revolving that curve around the x-axis. Everybody okay with that, to leave it? And this could be a test question, actually. Um, it is possible that I could say, set it up only, just to save some time, 
do not integrate nor evaluate. I've done that on a test before. Did I do that in 141? Which on is any with test? The, um, I may have on the exam, just to save some time. But once you get to this point, um, since integration was really at the end of 141, I'm kind of trusting that everybody has a pretty good mastery of this. Is that a good, good yeah. way to think, that That's I trust that everybody has Perfect. good mastery of that? Sounds good. Okay, let's go back to that problem that I thought of while we were doing that one. And it was a, the first time through, it was a washer problem. And I said I wanted us to do that again. So here's the problem we did yesterday, and then I want to slightly uh, adapt it. So we had y equals x squared plus 2. The equation was actually given to us a little differently than that, but it's that equation. We also had a line, y equals 1 half x plus 1. We had x equals 0 x equals 1. Now the problem we did, um, we took this bounded region and we revolved it around the x-axis. One-half x plus 1. Something like this. So we have that bounded region. There's the part of the parabola, y equals x squared plus 2. Here's the line with y-intercept 1 and slope of 1 half, x equals 0, and x equals 1. So we took that region, we revolved it around the x-axis, and we talked about the washers that resulted. Um, the other problem, let's say instead of revolving this around the x-axis, let's revolve it around a line that's parallel to the x-axis. Let's revolve this around the line y equals 3. And how will that change, first of all, what the region itself looks like, or this three-dimensional solid, what it's going to look like? And then how's that going to change as far as the equations that we set up, and then ultimately the integration that we do? Um, I think, I know it helps me to draw this, even though my drawings aren't the best in America. Probably not even the best in this room. There's the, the symmetric image on the other side of the line y equals 3. So we've got this three-dimensional solid that is formed. So let's chop through it with... Um, perpendicular to the axis of revolution. So our axis of revolution is y equals 3. So we're going to chop through it in this fashion. So one of these regions is going to look like a what? Washer. A washer. Now, are we going to be able to do it with the washer method? It kind of depends on if we're able to describe the inner and the outer radius somehow. So we're missing this volume in here. Is that correct? When we slice through it. So each one is a washer. So here's our axis 
of revolution. Uh, so this is kind of like a little cylinder on its edge with the volume missing out of the inside. What is the thickness? What are we dealing with here? A delta X. We chop it up this way. We get little delta X. X's, right? Some increment of X going from here to here. So our height is going to be delta X, which in the integrand is going to be represented by, how about DX instead? Uh, how about the inner radius? This is going to get cluttered in a hurry, so let's try the inner radius first. So this distance from the axis of revolution to here. Now, I just did that incorrectly because I went from the axis up to here. That's not really anything related to my original curve. So I probably want to go from the axis of revolution to one of my original curves. So I can get that same inner radius by coming down. Is that correct? This is one of my original curves. So this distance right here from the axis of revolution to this point on the curve. Got to get a little um, creative here. What do we know this distance is from this point on the curve down to the x-axis? What do we typically call that? We call that y. We know this entire distance is what? 3 plus 3, three from the yeah. x-axis up to the yeah. axis of revolution is 3. So if we know from here to here is y, three and the entire distance is 3, what do we want? 3 minus y. 3 minus y. Does that sound good? So the inner radius, sorry the diagram's cluttered and we kind of just got started is 3, which is this entire distance, minus y, y on what? y on the parabola. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 3 minus the y value on the parabola. So let's go from the axis of revolution now to the outer radius. Well, that would be from here to here. Let's. Uh, oh. Okay, we do know the value from here to here is the y value on the line. We do know this entire distance is 3, so isn't it going to be 3 minus the y value on the line? Sorry, this is so cluttered. So we've got our height, we've got our outer radius, 3 minus the y value on the line. We've got our inner radius, 3 minus the y value on the parabola. I think we're in business. I think this method is going to work. Um, since we're going to be integrating this with respect to x, where do we want to start and stop this particular problem? Where do we start to form these washers in terms of x, and where do they stop? 0 to 1. All right, let's see what it looks like. So the pi will bring out front, 0 to 1. Capital R is 3 minus the y value on the line. What is the y value on the line? Oh. So we're going to square that, right? 3 minus the y value on the line. There's the y value on the line. For little r, the inner radius, we want that to be the distance from here to here, which is 3 minus the y value on the parabola. What is the y value on the parabola? So I guess the question I need to pose, if I were... Um, trying to teach this adequately, which I actually I am. Some of you might find that hard to believe with a cluttered up diagram like that. Were we able to describe the inner and outer radius differently so that we can accommodate the fact that the inner radius and the outer radius are actually two different values? Yes. We were. They look the same here, 
but once we decided which y value, the y value on the parabola, y value on the line, we are able to describe them distinctly. So this method's going to work. If you're not able to describe them distinctly, it's not going to work. So we've got the pi. We took it out front. We've got our limits from 0 to 1. Outer radius, 3 minus the y value on the line. We've got to square that. Minus the inner radius squared, 3 minus the y value on the parabola. And our height is some increment of x or some delta x or dx in the integrand. I would recommend doing that arithmetic first before you square it, and the same thing here. So if we were to do one more step on the setup, what are we going to be squaring? What is 3 minus that quantity? 2 minus a half x? Is that right? And here, 3 minus this quantity is really going to be what? 1 minus x squared. So we've got a little work to do before we can actually integrate and evaluate, but I don't think anything we're going to encounter is going to be other than middle of the road kind of integration we've done to this point in time. Square this, remember you're going to get a middle term, right? Which is twice their product. Remember when you square this, you're going to get a middle term, which is twice their product. Anybody, we need to go any further on this to get a solution. So, in, in a way of a kind of an overly brief summary, if we're going to do, if we've got a volume of a solid of revolution, we could have a solid disk, which is going to be some version of that. If they're not solid, but they're washers when you chop them up perpendicular to the axis of revolution. I'll tell you the most common error I've seen here is big R minus little r, the quantity squared. That's not the way we were able to derive the volume in a washer. Outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. And then if neither one of those work and we have to jump to the um, cylindrical shell method, 2 pi r h, and then establish what the thickness is of that little rectangular region that we're spinning around the axis. Let me see before we stop. This will take about a minute, and then we'll wrap it up. This same problem. Actually, let's go all the way back to the first problem. So let's go back to the one where we wrap this around the x-axis. Now, we did this problem using the washer method. Could we do this problem using cylindrical shells? Let's see. Since this is our axis of revolution, we would want to take little skinny little elements of area, little rectangles, parallel.
are we going to be able to come up with a description for the radius of each cylindrical shell that's going to work for all of them and the height of each cylindrical shell that's going to work for every one of these. Some of you are shaking your heads now. Why not? What, what, do you see a problem here? You didn't go down the y-axis when you reached the top. They're not all bound by the same. Okay, yeah. we've got different boundaries, right, for, for these. We had a curve before that looked like this. So when we described that piece and we were asking the question, is that description going to work for this piece, wasn't it always from the y-axis over to this point? from the y-axis over to this point. We don't have that down here, do we? Because here we're from the y-axis over to this point on the line, and that's going to work for all these, right, until we get here, and then we're going to have from the y-axis over to here, which is really just what? One? All the way up to here? And then we've got a little change when we go up here. What is this distance? Well, we're not even coming from the y-axis over to here. I think we're going to ask, that's going to be trouble. You could break it up into pieces and do so in equal shell, but it, unless we can describe each little element of area that we form parallel to the axis of revolution the same way, this method's going to be a little tricky. But we don't need it anyway. To me, that method's a little more difficult than the washer method anyway. So if washer works, we ought to use it. If it doesn't, we ought to see if cylindrical shell is going to work. Okay, I think we are reasonably close to where we should be, according to the syllabus. Um, as I told you before class, I'm going to adjust deadlines for WebAssign, so um, when I'm done with that, I'll send an email to you so you'll know that deadlines have changed. Have a great weekend.